Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to Executive Health, the very first Executive Health live stream. This is going to be a little different than the podcast that will be starting back up, where it's a little more formal. And this is a little more of a laid back conversation that will be a mix of culture, a mix of science, and whatever else is kind of on top of my head. And so a lot of these things are going to be instances of what I feel inspired about at the moment. And and in just just different things as I go about life. And today I'm going to talk about overlook ways to build a healthier brain. And as we think about building a healthier brain, you know, you know, we talk about exercise, we talk about sleep, and we talk about nutrition. Those are the big ones, right? But there are layers and other things that we can do to build a healthier brain. And these are some of the more non-obvious ways. And the cool thing about this is that you can actually measure different aspects of your cognitive fitness and your cognitive health improving. So today, um, to do that, so as I said, we're going to do a little, a few things here. I got my tea. If this is your first time here, this is your first time coming across here. Thank you um, for joining go ahead and hit the like button, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. So you never miss one of these videos. The podcast is getting started back up. So we're going to have a lot of cool guests on that regard. And, and then we still do, and I still do some vlogs from time to time and then a bunch of other random stuff. So as I said, I'm Julian Hayes II. I run Executive Health. This is a place for entrepreneurs, executives, and investors to look, feel, and stay, this, and to stay at the top of their game. So they can enjoy the finer things in life. And to do this, we u- utilize something called precision performance longevity. And so let's go ahead and get this started. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so I have a little slideshow to go along here. And so the first thing is, when we think about cognitive health, why cognitive health matters. Oftentimes, you know, any successful business is going to have what you call KPIs, these key performance indicators. And the same thing in health. But a lot of times when we think about these KPIs, we think about from a physical standpoint, we think about body fat percentage, we think about um, we think about waist circumference, we think about the size of the bicep in those regards. But as an entrepreneur, as a high performer, as a high performing content creator, whatever your vocation may be that's in a high performing index, your cognitive health matters just as much. And so that's why you have the unique thing compared to the average person to where it's not just about physical fitness, but it's about the cognitive fitness as well. And so as I go along here and we think about cognitive fitness, and you hear this word a lot. There's 10 categories that I typically break cognitive fitness down into. And I forgot to, which I'll do another video later, where I will um, bring my CN, CNSVS uh, report, and you'll see <clears throat> the different breakdown of various areas with our brain and how it's performing. In, in, and it's a really cool tool. But Just to quickly go down here, when you're thinking about cognitive fitness, a lot of times we think about intelligence, but how does that, what what, what does that mean, intelligence? How is that broken down? Well, for one, in attention, in your focus, then you think about your motor control. That's going to control a lot of of our everyday movements. You think about memory. Some people just have excellent memory. You know, there's memory world champions. You think about your perception. You know, how are you interacting with the world? How the information that you're taking in, how are you processing this and then spitting it back out? The language that we use, you know, the social, the social and emotional components, and then the functioning of that, you know, planning and logic. That's a lot of our prefrontal cortex there when you think about planning and logic. And sleep is a huge component and huge piece that's connected with the planning and logic. Then we have the computational skills creativity and imagination. And lastly, you got motivation and inspiration. And so cognitive fitness is a huge, huge, huge entity that <clears throat> that is um, oftentimes not thoroughly explained. 
so the first area, the first area in terms of building a healthier brain is to eat omega threes and omega threes is used to be a buzzword, but it's pretty well understood. Now, everybody has typically heard of omega three fatty acids at this point in time now. And I like to say, when you think about protein, you think about muscles. When you think about calcium, you think about bones. And when you think about your brain health, I want you to think about omega threes. In particular, I want you to think about DHA when it comes to your omega threes. And the reason why, you know, as I have up here is that our brain, a large composition of it is just fat. And there's numerous types of fatty acids that's, um, that we have. But three main ones that you probably hear in the news is ALA, which is alpha linolytic acid. You, you'll hear EPA, which is ecoso, ecosopitanoic acid. And then you'll hear the casahexanoic acid. You'll hear those. But for today's lecture, we're going to do more of the DHA because we're focusing on our brain health now. Uh, but I, I do have a lecture plan in the future that is going to be all about fatty acids in, in that regard. Hey, what's up, man? I hey, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you for stopping by. Mr. Abla Conmigo TV. Hola, my friend. Appreciate it. Um, and so nutrition is going to dictate how our brain performs. And omega-3s are unique because we have to get this food from the food or we have to get it from the supplements. Our body is not going to make this. But the omega-3s are going to be a key, key structure on every cellular wall. So to put that in plain speak here, pretty much every facet of life, ranging from our blood pressure, ranging from our blood sugar regulate, our cognitive abilities, our physical abilities, is going to play a part with omega-3 acids. And DHA, another cool thing is that our brain, our sperm cells, and even our uh, retina and our, our eye cells has a huge percentage of this DHA. So I'm not sure about the research yet, but a lot of times people start to lose their vision or not to have as great vision as they progress in age. And so part of me is wondering, you know, what's the DHA content then? Is that person's omega-3 slower? Also, there's a great supplement out there called astaxanthin, which is which is beneficial for eyesight as well. And I take that. And it also has a nickname of an internal sunscreen. And but I'm gonna stay on I'm gonna stay on track here. So as let's progress here. And so here you'll see a chart that I have, and I tried to include most of it on here, so it may be a little blurry that you're seeing right now. But the most important thing I want to show you is that when you hear the word fatty acids, you it's encompassing everything. And so this is from a test called Omega Quant. And what they do here is you just measure the level of omega-3s or an omega-6, your overall fatty acid content. And a key one, as I said, is the DHA. And then you'll see the ALA that I've mentioned. ALA, and you're only going to get that from nuts and seeds. But a lot of problems that vegetarians sometimes typically run into when you see their ratios is that the conversion from just the ALA is not as beneficial and not as good and efficient as the EPA and the DHA. And so that's why those they may be eating healthy. But when we do some blood work, you'll see that their ratio is not as good. And at the bottom here, and I'm going to go back up in a little bit, you'll see a ratio here from omega-6 to omega-3. This is a key thing that pretty much every health person looks at. And an ideal is 4 to 1 and under. 5 to 1 is okay. And, and, and so omega-6 fatty acids. Now, sometimes you might see on the internet now people talking about different oils. So... You'll hear soybean oil, canola oil, vegetable oil, typical oils that people use every day. And they're high in omega-6. And I wouldn't say that they're necessarily bad. I would say they're not ideal because what that does is inflammation is not a bad thing. It's only a bad thing when it gets out of balance and the ratio gets too high. And that's the thing with a lot of these oils these hydrogenated oils, like the soybean, the canola, the vegetable oil, they're so concentrated 
in these omega-6 fatty acids that when you just can continually use that, what you're doing is you're going to expand that ratio that we looked at at the bottom here. And then that's going to leave you prone to more inflammation, which could then, you know, start to affect the cardiovascular system and so forth in that regard. And so that's why we really want to be monitored of the seed oils. And when you hear mono um, unsaturated fatty acids, think of olive oils and olive oil is the number one oil that I would recommend for people to use. The only problem is I believe when you start to cook it and you don't want to cook it at a high heat. So something you can do there is to use that avocado oil, or I think they don't make algae oil anymore. That was really good. And saturated fatty acids is where you get from the red meat. And what you see here is this is the names and the percentage in the middle is the blood. So you'll see that this person, you'll see the breakdown of each types of fatty acids this person has. And then over here is just a simple reference range of the fatty acids that this person is going to have. And to not get bogged down in the numbers, what you're going to do, a lot of this depends on genetics. And then a lot of this is going to be tailored to um, that individual and their genetics. And then you'll tailor that to their performance. And once you have this, then you can start to dial in and make more precise recommendations on what types of foods to eat in order to help have these ratios in their more ideal range. So as I said, omega-3 effects on the brain. We're talking about memory here. We're talking about approving your intention to detail, your mood and your charisma, your ability to assimilate and implement information. And this goes beyond a standpoint of just health. This goes, you being a better entrepreneur, you being a better content creator, you being a better executive, you just being a better person, a better human in general, because your brain is firing on all cylinders. This is giving you an unfair advantage. If everyone is doing the same type of work, if everyone is creating content, if everyone is a business owner, or if everyone in your sales organization does the typical day-to-day -day task, how can you get that advantage? And making sure your brain is firing on all cylinders and doing the extra things it's going to help. And that's where the omega threes is a big part of that. Now, this is just to show you that um, I like to sometimes add sources. And so this is just one study that I talked about with the DHA and adult memory. This is in plus one. I'm not going to go too into that. I don't really like research stuff. So I just have friends let me know about things and then I look at it. So this is DHA and its ability on memory in case you want to go look. And another one, which I thought is cool, is DHA and EPA when it comes to cognition and behavior. And we live in a world where mental health is becoming more and more of an issue and, you know, depression and anxiety. And I just wonder what are these people's ratios? What, what's their diet? Like, are they consuming fish? Are they using a bunch of seed oils and a bunch of processed food to where it's going to really skew that omega-6 really high and that omega-3 is low. And so that ratio is high and that's, that's just contributing to the problem the problem. And so, um, so this is a really cool study that I found that um, went with DHA and um, depression and mood. And so a couple things that I wanted to remember is I have a list that I'm going to show you after this slide here with terms of foods, but omega supplementation, and then remember the ratio of four to one and less. So this is a list. Um, I cut off some of the foods at the bottom just so I can get it on here. The foods at the bottom was catfish, cod, unfortunately. I love two of those fish, but they're not really high in EPA nor DHA. At the top of the list is herrings. And for me, and I guess I should say beforehand, when you're thinking about, yes, so for high, yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So for high heat, avocado oil is pretty good. Um, I forgot. You could probably use coconut oil a little bit as well for, for the um, for the high heats as well. But generally, to my knowledge, I, I don't think olive oil is the best one for that just because I think when you cook it at high heat, it starts some of the properties start to get oxidized. But I'll have to check on that. And so, yeah, so the top ones that I use and when you think about fish, I know people talk about maybe mercury poisoning and things like that. Generally, when you're thinking about mercury and eating a lot of fish, it's the big fish that, you know, so I don't think most people are going around eating a bunch of shark and just huge fish that are going to high a, um, they're going to high 
that are going to have a um what's it called a high mercury content and so let's see am i going to oh here's another question here am i going to link this doc you have on the screen here sure i can do that yeah i'll do that absolutely yeah i'll i'll do that and so um oh yeah so so as i was talking about so when you think about mercury content you also have to think about selenium because that's going to bind to that so a lot of the smaller fish like the sardines the anchovies the um the mackerel in the can not the king mackerel but the mackerel in the can the herrings which is i think goes by the name of kuiper as well a lot of those are going to have a much much higher concentration of selenium as opposed to the mercury so it's going to bind and so you're not going to get um, any issue of a mercury toxicity or anything now just to cover basis here there are some people that don't necessarily process mercury as well with their genetics and then maybe you do have to be a little more mindful of that but generally the small fish is fine and and especially the ones at the top of the list and so you'll see that the farm salmon because i know a lot of stores has farm salmon and there's a range because a lot of it depends on the feed of, of the of, it depends on the feed and how it was grown so that that ratio is going to be just all all over the place on that so i want to go to number two now and that is playing chess or some other similarly mentally simulated game and you know, part of being a great businessman, part of being a successful entrepreneur, a content creator, writer, whatever your vocation is that you're looking to thrive and dominate at, is being able to recognize trends and adapt to those trends. And that's what we have two parts of the brain for. So you have a right and a left hemisphere. And when you think about your right hemisphere, think about pattern recognition. And when you think about the left hemisphere, think about object recognition. And our brain, you know, as we're playing these games here, as we're playing chess, as we're focusing on chess or any other game of similar, um, similar value, what you're doing is you're actually, your brain's firing. You're, 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 if you could look inside your brain right now, you'll see all these little tree-like dendrites, these little, almost like the tree of life picture. And your brain is firing. You got this electricity going. And these are dendrites. These are the tree-like branches. And what they're doing is they're conducting signals from different neurons into the neuron they're attached to. So you're making more connections in your brain, which is meaning then that these neurons are being bigger and faster. And as an everyday result of that in the real, in the world, the physical world that you can see, what this means is you're processing information and just your overall general IQ rises. I remember there's a, when I was early on in college, before I started really working on my eating, I was not as mentally sharp as I am now. And just over the course of the years now, I've noticed that, you know, just from people talking that's like, you're really sharp or smart now. I don't, I don't know about that. I like to say I'm maybe well learned or something, but there is something with this and you can hook people's brains up, which I mean, it's not easily accessible to do that. But you, you would see a person's brain that has a lot more connections with it compared to a person who doesn't. So this is a study in the Journal of Experimental Psychology. And basically, I wanted to put this on here just to show um, that this is not made up. When you're, when you're talking about chess, they looked at a novice and they looked at an expert with that. And what they did is both sides of the brain started to benefit and improve just from playing this type of game. So it's, you know, I, I like to think about that. It's beneficial to just think it's beneficial to even do crossword puzzles. I know we used to laugh at some of the, the, um, the old folks and stuff like that who did the crossword puzzles, but anything that really gets your brain firing, you are keeping you you're, you, that's an anti-aging tool that is easy to implement because a lot of times if you don't use it, you lose it. Think about how many people stop being as active as they get older and their muscle has no reason to stay. And so therefore it's going to atrophy. The same thing with your brain. If you're not continually challenging your brain over the course of time, that it has no reason to really be there and, and perform like it should. And so the third one here, this is one of my favorites, is to learn a new language. And, you know, when we think about business culture, when we think about, um, just 
relating to people is think about you travel to a new country and say you travel to, I don't know, let's say, say you're going to Argentina. And so you have to learn Spanish there, the Spanish speaking country, your ability, your ability and having the ability to speak Spanish there is opening up an entire country of people, millions of people. I don't know the population there, but millions of people there. And I just think that's, that's something that's just amazing. Even if you don't know the language fully, just the sheer fact that you are able to communicate and open up your network to millions of other people is, is fascinating to me. Now, from a scientific standpoint, you're going to increase the volume of your brain. And then that may sound weird and just janky that you're going to increase the volume of your brain, but it's an actual evolutionary advantage that's been studied as well, that, you know, the more volume in your brain, a bigger brain is useful. Now, I don't think our brains is as big as the old days because it was also perhaps a danger. You could, you know, one shot to the head and you had a bigger brain, you were not going to survive. So for, from an evolutionary standpoint, I think we had to have this come down a little bit for our survival, for our species. Yeah. Um, that's another side thing. <laughs> so, uh, so practicing a language, what you're going to do here is let's go to the next thing. So practicing a language, this is a study in neuro, um, image and here practicing a language, just, just a sheer thing of practicing a language generates an increase in your hippocampal volume and simply think of hippocampal volume. Think of that as one of the main structures that's going to be linked to your memory. And practicing a language, something for 15 to 20 minutes a day, perhaps using something like Memrise. I think there's Duolingo. There's a lot of great YouTube channels like my man, Abla Camigo. Um, I think there's Pimsleur. I think that there's so many different tools that you can use. And uh, let's see what we got. Yeah, I think that's the main ones. And I think there's even language exchanges, even when you go out. So um, there's really no reason why you can start to just learn a few words a day, maybe five or five words a day, and you're still doing something for your brain in addition to the exercising and the um, sleeping that everyone does. These are just little things to add on to that. You're stacking conditions in your favor. This is another cool one. And this one here was for people who are more into the business sense and are maybe in sales. And people who started to learn an additional language, what they did was, just to summarize this whole research study, is that they picked up various nuances and subtleties. They picked these up quicker. And they were also became a person who made more rational-based decisions as opposed to emotional-based decisions just from something as learning a language. And I will say, when I, I've seen a few brain scans and I've seen a person, I've seen a sleep-deprived person and I've seen a person as well rested. And the same thing happens there where this person is operating a lot more rationally when they're, when they're sufficiently rested. And that's because their prefrontal cortex is still firing as it should, as opposed to the person who's sleep deprived, where they have less of this prefrontal cortex going and more of this amygdala. And this amygdala is more primitive and you're, just, you're acting on emotion. So one of my theories, I can't prove this, is that a lot of the world is sleep deprived. And so a lot of people are going to then act out of emotion, act out of aggression, first and foremost, instead of being rational based, because they're using this primitive thing that we've had a lot longer compared to the prefrontal cortex. But I don't think you could ever do these kind of studies. But I do think a lot of people are just sleep deprived. And so then they're going to act a lot more from just the emotional standpoint. So number four here is a writing practice. And I also think just content creation in general. You know, the study that I have here is concerning writing and journaling, but I really think content creation as well, because anytime you're creating, you're getting your brain firing. And so I think this it's going to be similar pathways that are going to be um, firing here. And a big part of writing is that it's therapeutic. And I think for some people, just creating videos, editing, that's therapeutic for them as well. Podcasting, I think that's therapeutic. So I think 
if they did an updated version of this, I think they would see that any type of creation is going to be beneficial for brain health. And, you know, think about as you're building a business, especially at the very early stages where you're building a channel, you're building a podcast, whatever you're building at the very beginning stages, there's a lot of stress. There's a, and it's tough. I mean, I went to therapy during the early parts of my time, just because I was so stressed out from this whole thing. And one of the things I was told was to start writing and just journaling. And they said that it would help with depression. It would help with um, anxiety. And I was like, I, I guess I'll give it a try. Uh, you know, we'll see. I'll, I'll give it a try. And these things lead to better decision making because your brain is not as foggy and it's not it's not as just all over the place. And so I looked this up and this was a study in 2005 in psychiatric treatment. And, and the interesting thing here is that these people, which I have highlighted here, 15 to 20 minutes, three to five occasions, they just wrote down emotional, stressful, and traumatic events. And I think for people in general, doing this on a daily basis to just almost like a word vomit. I know there's a book called um, The Artist's Way. I think it's Julia something. And she talks about morning pages. And you write two to three. I think you write three pages every morning, the first thing. And you're just getting all this stuff that's just in your head out. You don't even read it. Just write it to get it out so you can have a fresh perspective and, and have a clear conscience to go about your day. And so these people, they wrote about this. This improved their physical and their psychological health. A lot of times people think it's just the psychology. But when we talk about health, especially over here, it's a systems mentality. Everything is connected. I always use the analogy of the octopus. You have the head of the octopus, and but then you have those tentacles. And those are the different facets of life. But if that head, which is our psyche, our mental, is not firing, then the rest of the tentacles are not going to do that. So they all feed into this ecosystem here. And so the last one here is one of my favorites, which is learning how to dance. Now, a little bit of my story with how I got involved with it is I'm a little rusty now, so I'm not like an expert dancer or anything. But um, I was in New York and we went out to this place. I think it was around Columbus Circle. And I was just having a drink, just listening to the music. And I started nodding my head. And I guess they were salsa dancing. And so some girl came and grabbed me, brought me out there. I had no idea what to do. She thought I knew how to dance because I could nod my head while sitting at the bar. But I, I had two left feet. I got left out in that department. And so I, I made a promise to myself that never again. So I came back home to Nashville. And what we're doing here is I, I remember going to my first lesson. Like my palms are a little sweaty. It sounds like the Eminem song. And... I was like, I'm going to go in here for five minutes, just five minutes. I'm going to go in here. And, you know, okay, this is the first five minutes. Okay, 10 minutes. And I remember when I first started, right, I didn't know how to move my hips or anything. It just felt weird. And so I was just like marching, like a soldier, just marching. But, you know, you start doing it. You started getting into it. You started getting into it. And over time, I started going weekly, and then you fall off again, and then life happens. But, um, so over the course of time, you know, I've tried bachata, I've tried tango, I've tried Brazilian zook, I've tried um, kizomba, and of course there's salsa, not salsa on two too much, mostly salsa on one. I know there's different versions. And so, but what one thing I noticed though about dancing, which I should, I'm going to do this, I'm going to make a note for myself, I'm going to do a video on how dancing, salsa dancing, and a lot of Latin dancing is beneficial to both your health and your professional development. But for me, what it did, you know, I have things up here like confidence in improvisation, but it made me a better leader because a man, as a man, you have to lead as a man, you have to communicate. And a lot of that communication is nonverbal. A lot of that communication is just with your fingertips and just your movement and how that translates to everyday life is a lot of communication that we do on a day by day basis is nonverbal. Only 7% is verbal. The other part is the 93% that is nonverbal. So dance is actually kind of a reflection of life to a certain standpoint, and just how you can make eye contact and how your posture can communicate and say so many different things. And this is how it is in, um, in 
how it comes about um, with um, with dancing and business. And so, yeah, man. Um, I mean, I go down so many rabbit holes with with dancing just to see, you know, uh, it's it's amazing how so many things that we kind of overlook in a day by day basis, these things have health benefits. And you know, a lot of times people think about health as just exercise and just running. But a lot of things that we that if we implement it day by day, we could stack those on top of the typical exercising that we do. And that in itself is a very easy longevity anti-aging plan before even implementing any of the toys and the cool things that are coming now. And so I, I really want people to to know about this. It, you know, it, I mean, it's a great way to get girls, obviously, but um, there's so many health benefits as well. And so. You know, speaking of that, that leads me into the um, study here with cerebral health. And so this study here was about, it was social dancing. I believe it was the tango. And the tango is a little more technical. It's a, it's a little more technical compared to um, compared to salsa. It's a little, I think it's a little more rigid. But um, so this was that. But I think the other ones are going to translate just as well. And And so if we think about, before I even go into this, as we age, typically, you think about a person who has weight that's stubborn that can't come off. We think about a person that's colder, typically. We think about a person whose clock is earlier, so they're going to sleep earlier, or they got to take their, or they just typically have those early afternoon naps. And then we also think about a person who's just not as mentally sharp. They just can't remember things as well as they used to. So this person has decreased motor skills, decreased cognition, and decreased ability to perceive and, and react and adapt to the world. That's the typical narrative when we think about aging. It doesn't sound good at all. This study here, though, what they did was, and I believe this was a way to look into dementia and other um, brain ailments. That was, that was the backdrop of this one here. And these, pity, these people picked up dancing. Because I think the word here is sensorimotor rhythmic activity. It's a very fancy way of saying basically how they're operating in space, their balance, their proprioception, and moving. That's, that's basically all that is. It sounds a very fancy word. But in this study, what they did, they improved their spatial memory. They preserved and even enhanced their motor skills. So as an old person, think about you typically lose your balance a little more or, you know, the way you move your hands and everything, it's just not as fluid. So they lose a lot of that fluidity. And so these people just by dancing kept those things and even improved it. Now I'm not saying this is going to be the only thing that's going to help with someone that is prone to cognitive issues as they get older. Food's going to be a big part in that as well. Absolutely. But the exercise component, dancing as well because if you think about it when you're dancing you're not only getting activity you're not only exercising but you're also working on your social skills you're having a sense of community which we study some of the longest living populations in the world in the blue zones one of the big things is to have a sense of purpose to have a sense of community loneliness truly kills people there's a reason why a lot of times when someone loses a spouse after years of being together, that person has a higher probability in the in the in the next few months passing as well. And so, if you know people out there, really monitor them during that that time after the few months. I thought about this with my father after he passed to really be there for my mom and and to do things because that's a very um, tough period to adjust to having someone and then not having that connective tissue with you and. So we have those things here, and that's the social dancing. So to highlight this and to, to think about our brains, when your brain is firing, your body is going to follow. So a quick recap is to eat more omega-3s, to play chess, any other stimulating men mental game, learn a new language, learn a few, um, commit to some type of creation process, you know, create over just consuming, be a creator, not a consumer. It's good for your mental health. It's it, I think it's good for the world. 
um, I don't want to get too philosophical, but I, I just think that just the act of creating, you feel good about yourself. Like I know just doing this, I'm going to do my training session after, but just doing this here, just creating for the day, you have a sense of accomplishment and not it. And you can't put everything in a research study. Sometimes you just have a, a sense, you just intuitively know certain things. And the last one is to learn how to dance. Not only is it cool, it's a very cool card. Um, you won't have two left feet, but pretty much for me, what I did when it comes to dancing is that I knew anytime I travel now, there's a couple of things I can rely on. I'm going to find where the jazz places are, maybe some bookstores and things like that, because I'm interested in that. And then if I need some social stuff, I'm going to see where the people are dancing, where some salsa stuff at. So when I went to Portugal and I went to this dance thing and just to meet people, and people didn't even know I was from America until maybe 30 minutes in. I knew just the basic amount of Portuguese then. But then I also knew, like I said, I knew how to dance. And most of the dancing is nonverbal. So I could communicate easily because I knew how to lead the woman and everything. It was only until they started talking really fast that I got lost. And then they discovered I was from America, the South. Now, they thought I was from some island at first, which I appreciate, but I told them I'm from South Nashville, Tennessee. And they talked about, oh, that's where big trucks. So I guess that's what people think of the South. But this is me going on a different diatribe here. So this is it. And I want to thank you, you know, for paying, for watching this. Any questions about this, you can go to exechealth.io. You can email me. Don't forget to like and subscribe, as I mentioned at the very beginning. And I'm going to add that chart with the different fishes on there when I have this up. And for people who are watching this in the future at a different date, thank you for watching as well. So everyone, stay awesome, be limitless, and go be the CEO of your health and life. Peace.